So you know now that the Romans overthrew their Etruscan rulers and became a republic in the 6th century BCE. Rome then proceeded to conquer the surrounding Italian cities, and then, over the next 150 years, Rome gained control of the hugely wealthy Greek colonies on what is now the island of Sicily. Next, they fought a long and bloody battle with Carthage for control of the Mediterranean. This map shows the area that Rome controlled by 215 BCE. From an art history standpoint, the conquest of the Greek colonies in Sicily was hugely important. The Roman army hauled back wagon loads of Greek sculpture and its citizens were hooked. From here on, Romans would be dedicated collectors and imitators of Greek art. Well, sorry, I've packed a lot into this slide. Imperium is a vital concept in Roman history. It's the word that became the root word of emperor and imperial, but what it really means is the power and authority that a government ruler wields. Roman art is all about power and authority. Power in Rome was in fact complicated, and it was often up for grabs. The two executive rulers of the Republic, the consuls, were selected by and at least in theory ruled by consent of the Senate, a group of powerful older men from noble families. In times of crisis, and war like Rome faced a lot of crises, the consuls could appoint a dictator and hand all power over to him for six months. Roman patricians or nobles competed for political and military leadership, which conferred dignitas. While this is the root of our word dignity, it meant much more. Status, honor, popularity, importance, this was what Roman leaders sought, sometimes at the expense of Republican principles. This is a good term for you to remember because much Roman art attempts to capture this quality of dignitas. The same pattern was repeated inside the Roman family. The father or pater familias literally held power of life and death over his children and something pretty close to this power over his wife. The patricians, or nobles, in turn ruled over the plebeian free citizens, and everyone ruled over the country's many slaves. Roman Republican portraits were all about dignitas. Roman patrician society was obsessed with lineage. Noble families kept wax images of their ancestors in cupboards in their homes. The statue on the right shows a patrician with busts of his ancestors. Oops. There we go. <laughs> the stat status that came with age and lineage is reflected in veristic or truthful art. It may not actually have been entirely truthful. There is some evidence that subjects may have asked their wrinkles be exaggerated to convey more age and experience than they actually had. Nevertheless, this is an intriguing contrast with Greek sculptural ideals. We see a different set of values, less worship of youth and beauty, more admiration for the wisdom that comes from age. I have to kind of like that. So I couldn't resist. A uh, veristic portraiture can get a little weird. This general's portrait combines the age and wisdom in his facial features with a body that presumably is intended to convey vigor and physical strength. Hmm. So let's continue our breakneck race through Roman history with a video clip about Caesar Augustus, the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of the empire. Let me emphasize just a few points. First, along with Napoleon, Augustus is the master of using art as political propaganda, as a tool not only to express, but even more to bolster, to support his power and authority. He treated Roman patricians, especially the members of the Senate, with flawless respect and courtesy that almost disguised the reality that he had stripped them of all but symbolic power. He consciously manipulated the people's desire to return to the somewhat mythical days of a virtuous republic, but he also recognized that he could not use age and experience to justify the legitimacy of his rule. Not when he was 20 years old when he first assumed power as part of a triumvirate of rulers and just 28 when he became Rome's sole ruler. So he turned to another tradition, ancient Greece. What similarities and differences do you see between these two famous statues? And what's behind the differences? The idealized male bodies are very similar Look at the legs and feet, for example, and of course, that manly chest. 
Similarly, the contrapposto stance and the stern but beautiful faces are quite similar. But with what important difference? Augustus is facing forward at his audience and his hand is extending out to his people as well. Augustus is also wearing clothes. Why? Well, first of all, his army uniform carries a lot of symbolism, but Augustus also portrayed himself as returning Rome to a more sexually virtuous, family-oriented age. The paterfamilias of the whole empire should keep his clothes on. As you heard in the Khan Academy podcast, I hope, we see other important symbols in this statue of, of Augustus. This detail is missing from the College Board image, which uses the version in the Vatican Museum, but he was probably carrying the baton of the Office of Consul, shown here. This wasn't just a symbol of power, it was a symbol of Republican power. Again, remember that Augustus was claiming to be restoring the Republic, not creating a new political regime. He's wearing the costume of a general, the Imperator, a term that actually means commander of the Roman army, not emperor. The leather fringe, bottom right, was part of that costume. In fact, military historians don't think that much of Augustus as a general, but he had the good sense to employ a very good general, Agrippa, and to take credit for his victories. Augustus was always all about seizing a propaganda advantage. The relief on the breastplate plate, or cuirass advertises the return of the Roman military standards that had been captured by the Parthians. Those were the successors of the Persians in the east. And they were captured from Augustus's rival Crassus. Augustus gets them back. There are also allusions to various Roman deities, including Mars, the god of war, as well as personifications of the latest territories conquered by Augustus, Hispania, Gaul, Germania, and Parthia. The Cupid symbolized the Julian family's alleged descent from Venus. Cupid was another of Venus's sons. His bare feet, a little odd with a general's uniform, don't you think, offer another subtle hint of his godlike status. Gods are depicted barefoot. So there were many, many copies of the statue throughout Ro the Roman Empire, a little like president's portraits hanging in federal offices all over the country. The image in the college board set was discovered in the 1800s and it still bore traces of paint. A workshop in the Vatican Museum studied these paint fragments and produced this model of what the painted statue probably looked like. Now this famous work didn't make the college board cut, but I think looking only at the Augustus of Prima Porta will give you a lopsided view of the ways that Augustus used art for political propaganda. Almost all Roman monuments celebrate military victory in one of Rome's many imperial wars. This monument is quite deliberately an exception. By the time Augustus took power as princeps, first citizen, and imperator, commander-in-chief, and a little later, Pontifex Maximus, or high priest, Rome had been embroiled in civil wars for a century. The citizens were tired of war. They were eager for a stable, predictable rule, and this monument celebrated peace, the Pax Augustae, later called the Pax Romana. So here we get a closer look at the procession from the frieze in the Pax Romana and compare it with the Panathenaic procession. Note that the frieze on the Arapaches shows the royal family interacting. We even see children tugging on cloaks. Art historians debate over why kids show up in this frieze, and almost no others. But one theory is that Augustus was pushing fertility to populate his empire. And it's just as well. The empire has a lot of conquering to accomplish. Stay tuned.